it's now time for member statements. The member from Huron, Bruce. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As we all know, our Toronto Blue Jays are in the midst of their postseason American East division against Cleveland. And I have some good news today. A dairy farmer from my riding of Huron Bruce is giving us another great reason to cheer them on for the, and cheer on the players to get on, get as many home runs as possible. Today, I would like to acknowledge Derek Van Dieten, a dairy farmer from Seaforth, Ontario. Mr. Van Dieten will be donating 100 litres of milk to local food banks every time the Toronto Blue Jays hit a home run okay. in their postseason. So far, the Jays, including last night, have hit 10 home runs during their playoff games, and that means that Mr. Van Dieten has already donated a total of 1,000 litres of milk this postseason alone. And this is not the first time that Mr. Van Dieten has donated. Last year, Last year, the Jays had donated, uh, in, in terms of milk, uh, with the achievement of 14 home runs, 1,400 litres of milk. This donation is just one of many that he gives during the year. And I want to offer a sincere thank you to Mr. Van Dieten for the inspiring manner in which he demonstrates support, not only for our local food banks, but for our Toronto Blue Jays as well. And I would like to, the, to encourage others to follow his example. And just as I close, I just want to say, I hope there's more reason today for Mr. Van Dieten to donate yes. more litres of milk. <laughs> Goes Jay, go Jays, go. Yeah. The member statements. The member from Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. You know, Speaker, I never get tired of talking about uh, the great people uh, in my riding of Essex and the great things that they achieve and contribute to. And every year since 1978, the town of Essex has held their annual Citizens of the Year Award banquet. Uh, this year, they will honor Tim Catherwood for his outstanding service to the town. I'm pleased to take a few moments to honor Tim here in the uh, chamber uh, to acknowledge some of his contributions. Tim's working career is very impressive and diverse. He has served in senior leadership positions in business, labour, and in the public sector. However, a lifetime of community involvement is even more impressive. Speaker. Tim has served or is currently serving as the vice chair of the Hotel Du Grace Health Care Board of Directors, the chair of board of directors of the Changing Lives Together Foundation, member of the board of the United Way Windsor Essex County, chair of the United Way cabinet, uh, campaign cabinet for 2015 2016. Uh, former chair of the board of directors of the Teen Health Centre, former co-chair of the board of the Windsor Essex Community Health Centre, and former member of the board of the Brain Injury Association of Windsor and Essex County. Tim and his wife Diane live in Essex. They have three children and five grandchildren. Tim enjoys golf and is an avid sports fan, especially the Oakland Raiders. And on behalf of our entire community, thank you, Tim. Your leadership and dedication to the people of Windsor Essex is inspiration, inspirational, and I look forward to joining you and everyone else at the banquet on October 22nd. Thank you, Speaker. Okay, for the member, statement, the member from Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise and talk about a wonderful event that I attended in my riding of Scarborough Southwest this past weekend. On Saturday night at Midland Avenue Collegiate Institute Auditorium, the Ontario Bengali Cultural Society hosted a cultural event that brought together Bengali Canadian and international artists for an incredible night of music and dance. I was fortunate to be among one of the 1,000 people, or more than 1,000 people, who took part in this event. And let me say, the performance gave us quite a show. Their talent, their passion, their creativity, and their pride in their culture were on full display and made for a truly unforgettable evening. Mr. Speaker, Bangladeshi Canadians have made countless significant contributions to our province, and this event served to highlight their important role in strengthening the multicultural fabric that keeps Ontario's community strong. So I'd like to thank the Midland Legion Institute for hosting the event, in the Ontario Bengali Culture Society for their efforts to organize and put the show together. And of course, I'd like to give a huge thanks to all the talented performers who share their incredible artistic gifts with us. I, it was truly a night I won't so forget, and I'm already looking forward to the next one. They're very involved, and they want to get um, more, more involved in the province and uh, in, uh, in Toronto, and particularly in the riding of Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the member's statements. The member from Dufferin Caledon. Thank you, Speaker. I want to share with the House one of the letters that I've received far too many of uh, from constituents living in Dufferin Caledon about their exorbitant hydro bills. Uh, allow me to read expert excerpts from their letter. Quote, we are a low-income family of four living in a small bungalow with electric everything. What we don't understand is why our delivery charges are almost as high as our electricity charges. We conserve energy as much as possible, as you can see from our bills, which show that we use the majority of our electricity on non-peak hours. We have no air conditioning, but we run ceiling fans and other fans throughout the house to try to keep cool. 
Why is my summer time bill so high? It shows we only use $239 in actual electricity, but it costs 206 to deliver it. We could go on and on, but the bottom line is this needs to stop before we lose everything we have worked so hard for all of these years. This is just one of the many stories I hear regularly from families and businesses in my riding about their difficulty in paying their hydro bills. Our province has reached the point where hundreds of thousands of families are having difficulty paying their monthly hydro bill. Just last year, 567 residential electricity customers were in energy arrears. This is unacceptable. It's time for a real plan, and I urge the minister and the government to make real changes to make electricity affordable for Ontarians and businesses so we can get Ontario back on track. Thank you. Thank you. Further members' statements? The member from London South. No. West. London West. <laughs> Did say that afterwards. Okay. Um, speaker, last month I was pleased to attend the launch of the London chapter of the AODA Alliance and would like to offer my congratulations to the new London co chairs, Jeff Preston and Lisa Klinger. I also want to recognize David Lepofsky of the AODA Alliance, who was present for the launch and whose leadership and determination have contributed so much to the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. With support across party lines and from the broader business community, the AODA AODA held the promise of eliminating barriers facing Ontarians with disabilities. Yet, despite the high hopes that accompanied its passage, the AODA has made little difference in the lives of Ontarians living with disability. Frustrated by the limited gains achieved after a decade of provincial advocacy, local chapters of the AODA Alliance are being formed across Ontario, as in my community of London, to push for change at the community level. While the government's recent agreement to develop a health standard in accessibility is welcome, another standard is meaningless if it is not enforced, and there has been no commitment on the development of an essential standard for education, both K-12 and post-secondary. Multiple reports on the Liberal government's lack of progress in meeting the 2025 AODA deadlines raise serious questions about this government's commitment to accessibility. Without strengthened standards, and rigorous enforcement, there is no hope that we will achieve a fully accessible Ontario by 2025. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements. The member from Ancaster, Dundas, Flamborough and Westdale. Thanks, Speaker. I want to uh, share a story about a four-and-a-half-year-old uh, boy from Hamilton I once knew who, because his mother experienced a period of poor health, went to live with his grandmother in downtown Hamilton. One day, this uh, adventurous lad rode his tricycle down Bay Street all the way to Main Street. He thought it was the steepest hill in the world. At the bottom, he was frightened, uh, discovered uh, he was quite a long way from home. And no matter how hard he tried, Speaker, he was unable to ride his tricycle back up the hill. A young man came along and, sensing the boy's distress, asked if he could help. So he did help by carrying the boy's trike under his arm and walking the boy back home. It turns out the man was a part-time YMCA staffer. He spoke to the boy's grandmother, suggesting the boy become involved with the YMCA. For years, that boy thought his 25 cents every three months paid for his membership. The boy made new friends, became more confident, and developed skills that helped equip him to cope with the challenges of growing up. The YMCA saw this young boy not as a child of limited means, but as a person of unlimited potential. That boy was me. Well, much has changed uh, since that tricycle ride down the hill. One thing remains. Many in my community are, are committed to being difference makers. I recently had a chance to celebrate work being done by two organizations in the city, Dundas Roots Youth Centre and City Kids, both doing incredible work with inner city kids. Organizations like these try to make our beloved city a better place to live, they transform lives each and every day, one child at a time. Rather than curse the darkness, these community organizations dedicate themselves to lighting candles of hope. They do so with passion and resolve. I want today to thank them for their courage, leadership, service, and their willingness thank you. to always help a little guy up the hill. Thank you. Thank you. Further member statements? 
The member from Perry Salmon Scope. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in this House today to highlight concerns recently brought to my attention by members of Coopy Local 2049 representing the Children's Aid Societies for the District of Nipissing and Perry Sound. They brought up a number of concerns. Of the issues raised, the most pressing was the apparent clawback in funding. Funding has become so restrictive, the local CAS have been forced to cut any unmandated programs. There's no training allowance available. Workers have been forced to reduce phys physiological assessments. Offices are vacancy managing mandated programs, and enrichment options formerly available to children have been cut. This is resulting in overburdened frontline workers. How can we expect these workers to provide the support mandated by the ministry to the children under their care when we do not support the workers themselves? In one instance, the Perry Sound District CAS was forced to cut its foster parent recruitment position, resulting in the decline in the number of foster parents. This has forced the CAS to use privatized group homes more often for longer periods of time. Financially, a private home can cost between $100 to $300 per day per child. A foster family, on the other hand, is paid $29 per, per day per child. Beyond the obvious higher cost of group homes, we must ask what is best for the child. Recent office closures have been concerning as well. In a recent merger, the Berks Falls office was closed and workers relocated to North Bay. Through this process, the frontline workers in Berks Falls were given just five day no, di, days' notice of the impending changes. In the push to modernize our children's aid services, it is imperative that we make sure that our actions here at Queen's Park create more stable and more caring environments for children in their care and not the other way around. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The member stand next to the member for Bradley Gorn Mall. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Kinetics.ca just released a report saying that Brampton is now the most expensive city in all of Ontario to insure your vehicle. What makes it worse is that this government has so horribly failed the people of Ontario by allowing the insurance industry to continue to cut coverage to the point that they slashed benefits for catastrophically impaired people. These are the most seriously injured people in the province, and this government has slashed their coverage. In addition, to make matters even worse, the premiums are now going up in this province. They've recently approved rate increases of 12%. Mr. Speaker, this is simply deplorable. People in this province are struggling to pay their insurance premiums. They're seeing their benefits slashed by this government allowing insurance companies to do that. And on top of that, this government is now allowing insurance industry to increase the rates. Mr. Speaker, we're seeing less coverage, less benefits, but increased premiums. This government has a responsibility to ensure that premiums are fair. This government has a responsibility to ensure that insurance companies don't exploit the people of this province, but they're not doing that job. The people of this province are being exploited, insurance companies are making record profits, and the fault lies squarely at the feet of this Liberal government. Thank you. The member, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker. October is Hispanic Heritage Month in Ontario. For the second year in a row, Hispanic Heritage Month will honour the more than 400,000 Ontarians of Hispanic descent and serve as a chance to remember, elevate, and educate future generations about the achievements of our Hispanic Latino community. I know that this year, just like last year, October will bring the entire Hispanic Latino community together to celebrate Ontario's diversity. I'm privileged to represent the great riding of Davenport, which has such an active and engaged Hispanic Latino community. Mr. Speaker, in the beginning of October, I attended the start of Hispanic Heritage Month in Davenport with a Mayan sacred fire ceremony organized by members of the Hispanic Canadian Heritage Council. And I also attended Latinlicious, a fantastic food truck festival celebrating the flavors of the over 20 different cultures of Latin America. My office also celebrated the beginning of Hispanic Heritage Month with an art gallery opening in my constituency office. The ex exhibits feature artwork from Casa Cultural Colombiana, the Davenport Perth Neighborhood Community Health Senior Spanish Seniors Group, and performances from a group of talented Spanish speaking seniors group, Bailando Forever. It was also great to start Hispanic Heritage Month in Davenport with all of these celebrations. At Queen's Park, we celebrated as well all things Hispanic Latino, and I had the pleasure of helping launch Hispanic Heritage Week in Hamilton, a great celebration organized by Asociación Fraternidad Hispana. It is clear that the events around Hispanic Heritage Month keep growing every year. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to thank all members for their statements.